Good morning and welcome to the show. It's Monday morning, so you know what that means. I have Dr. Roman Nation here in the studio. And we're going to talk about your health. We're going to talk about medicine and maybe what it takes to become a doctor and how rewarding <laughs> that is. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Morning, Nation. Sir. Yeah. You know, we were talking off camera about starting your own practice. Now, mm -hmm. I know you were an Air Force doc, and that's where I think I first met you at yep. Pindle. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you, you got out of the Air Force and you started your own practice. That's yes. like starting up a whole new business, isn't it? It's, it's exactly just like starting a whole new business. You know. And like any business owner knows, you really don't make any money in the first year or two. Not for a long, long time. Yeah. yeah we were, we were sweating bullets for, the, for quite a while, yeah. but we started really tiny. And the problem, problem I had with and why I ended up doing it on my own is because when I was getting out of the military, I approached at least a half a dozen other docs, both some that were younger and some that were older, you know, talking about wanting to retire and said, hey, well, you know, I'll come and join with you and pay my dues and, you know, work into a partnership kind of thing. No, 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 we don't want to do that is, is how the whole thing ended up mm -hmm. working out. And that after, you know, kind of running into some dead ends, uh, you know, six times, it wasn't an unreasonable approach in my opinion, but uh, I just ended up saying, okay, I guess, um, you know, I, uh, I got to do this on my own because yeah. one, one group wanted me to work full time to the point where I could never see my kids. And then the other group, you know, wanted to do things that, that the way that I don't like to so, practice so medicine. So it really kind of forced your hand to do your own thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wish I could have done it a different way, but mm -hmm. it just didn't work out that way. Uh, you know, it's funny, though. Most people think, you know, you doctors are loaded. You make so no, much money yeah. and, you know. Not necessarily it, so, is it? Especially starting out. Not, not even close. We, um, there are so many... Um, red tape things to go through to, uh, for insurances like Medicare and Blue Cross sure. and Aetna, and you have to go through each and every single insurance uh, for that. You know, even even since we, you know people knew me from the military, so I had a bit of a following, but I could even see them through their insurance because the insurance companies took four to six months to, to get wow. on, on there like, okay, fine, you can see him now, you know. Well, we, you're okay to see him at Tyndall, um, but when uh, when I got out on my own, same doctor, nope, doesn't matter, you know, whole different process. So you gotta have this whole administrative staff oh, yeah. to kind of chase the money down, yeah, don't you? Know? More than 30% yeah. of the overhead is, is all behind the scenes stuff. I have three different people that only deal with insurances and billing and stuff like that. And those aren't real, like, now, if, say you were an attorney, say you were a lawyer, yeah. and you had this administrative staff that was doing things. Those are billable hours Yeah. in, in, in a lawyer's world. Yep. I mean, they're yep. making phone calls, sending faxes, yep. whatever. Yeah, back and forth. Yeah, Not so a, much with uh, a doc, is it? No, none of, none of that, that ever gets reimbursed um, on uh, from, from the insurance perspective. So all of that is just overhead that you have to kind of suck up and eat yeah. um, while you're busy trying to take, pay, take care of That's just the patients. cost of doing business. And yeah. after all, it is... A business. I mean, you, you may have entered medicine for altruistic reasons. <laughs> yeah, you know, I did. To help I did. People, yeah. But when it really gets down to it, if yeah. you're going to survive, it's got to be. Yeah. Everybody has to have. A, everybody has to have yeah. a paycheck um, in order to. Sure. Order to do nobody it. works for free. Right. <laughs> Although it's kind of it's kind of ironic how we have. Except um, for me, of course, in the show. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. I do kind of work it's, for free. There's there, the funny thing to me is yeah. is that a lot of people in medicine. The system is wired incorrectly to begin with, but a lot of people go to the doctor thinking that, you know, that there's some sort of altruistic money that's just behind us. And, yeah. you know, there isn't, you know, unless it's a state funded, you know, yeah. health clinic type thing where, yeah, somebody else is paying their paycheck. Um, everything has to come from, you know, a, com a community effect. Nothing's truly free. Right. Yeah, I mean, it comes someone's from paying for it. Yeah, it comes from somewhere, you know, and um, and you know, we don't run extravagant stuff, and you know, we don't try to overcharge patients and things like that. So we have we have a lot of uh, you know a lot of overhead just trying to keep pacify folks and and insurances. Yeah. And not only that, and it isn't just the overhead and all, but just the 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 process to become a doctor. Yeah, there are certain milestones you have to hit. That are very expensive milestones. Yes, sir. So you incur a considerable amount uh, unless you're loaded. Um, yeah, unless you come from money. Ed yeah. yeah, educational debt. Yep. And that's yeah, we, pretty much uh, a fact of life, uh, life for most doctors, isn't it? They, um, yeah, the, that's one of the reasons why the, the trend of going into medicine is kind of weaning down um, to a large extent. There's, the population is growing, so the, the overall pool of people applying to medical school has not dwindled off very much. Um, but when you look at the, the population growth compared to the amount of people that are trying to go into medicine is, is actually getting smaller. Is it really? Mm -hmm. So proportionally, there are going to be less doctors available in yeah. the future. Yeah, well, especially in primary care, mm -hmm. you know, when, when, when you get into primary care for folks that are like everyday docs to try and handle your, your majority of your stuff, um, the, the, the trend in medicine is to go to the, the expensive stuff, you know, like dermatology and orthopedics or surgery, procedural-based mm -hmm. medicine, um, where the reimbursements are significantly higher, so you can 
work about the same and make two to three times as much money or work less and make the same amount of money as somebody who does primary care. Yeah, so just being a country doctor isn't all that lucrative, is not, it? Not anymore. Yeah. No, long gone are the days where, you know, folks would, you know, trade in chickens and stuff like that and, <laughs> yeah. you know, a bartering system. So if I show up with a chicken <laughs> at your practice, you won't take it? <laughs> no, it probably makes some other people sick. <laughs> yeah. i got to run off to the local weather, but sure. I'd like to talk about this a little more on the sure. other side. Of your local weather brought to you by the West Pittman Law Firm, westpittmanlawfirm.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm here with Dr. Roman Nation, and we're talking about what it takes to become a doctor and how to start a practice. <laughs> it's a, a really a long process, isn't yeah. it? I mean, it, and it's a lot of hard work that goes into medical school, I would imagine. Yeah. And oh, then, yeah, the, mm -hmm. the volume of medical school was unreal. I mean, I was, I was really good in high school and, and studied decently and, and got really good grades pretty easily. College wasn't all that bad, but the, the sheer volume of information that we got in medical school was almost about tenfold. Wow. Um, we were going through and had to literally memorize uh, about a thousand pages a month in medical school when, when we started. So it is a lot of study time. Yeah. yeah. And, and we, we lived at the school or Starbucks or wherever, you know, you're, you, could, you could study in the cadaver lab. I mean, yeah, you barely <laughs> saw the light of day. Hanging out, in the, studying in the cadaver lab, yeah. Yeah. That's, but, that's, I guess it's pretty quiet in there. Yeah. <laughs> that's when it people was, make a noise. It was. The There's lab, a distinctive yeah. smell that, yeah. uh, that yeah. you don't forget. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what most of them did. That's, and and uh, it's an expensive proposition. I can only imagine what... You know, the textbooks cost. Yeah. You know what tuition costs, all the other things that go, not to mention the cost of living. You have yeah. to survive. Yeah. I had, I had the benefit of the military paying for my medical school, so I actually mm -hmm. collected a paycheck um, while while I was in med school. But lots of other folks, you know, they go go through med school and come out with another hundred to $200,000 in debt just from medical school alone, not counting the amount of um, money they have to borrow from uh, college. Uh, you know, for yeah. their for their bachelor's for their degree, you have to have yeah. a bachelor's degree first, and then you get selected for medical school. And then not only that, but to get into medical school, you have to take the tests and things like that. So if you have trouble, any sort of trouble with test taking, then you have to, you know, buy tutoring and things like that, and all these other prep courses to get you ready so you can take the test uh, to apply to medical school to have a chance mm -hmm. of getting an interview to going to medical school. I mean, it's wow. a it's a very 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 selective process. It's, I would imagine it's very competitive as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. D depending on the schools that you go to, especially in the U.S. I mean, lots of people want to go to school in the U.S. Sure. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of programs now that are overseas or down like in the, in the Caribbean and in South America and things like that, where you can get an undergrad or a medical medical degree, and if you if you study enough and you can take some extra stuff and qualify f to to test here in the U.S. or apply for a U.S. residency to do that. So that may be a venue for, for some docs, right. I suppose, or the offshore schools, but there is a certain cachet or prestige of going to a U.S. school, I would imagine. Yeah, most people yeah. don't, you know, I don't put my degree up on my wall. You yeah. know, most people don't, don't ask me where I went, um, mm -hmm. but some do. Yeah, I guess they would. Now, if a young person uh, wanted to become a doctor, or maybe there's a mom or a dad out there who's watching mm -hmm. this now, you know, would you recommend it to a young person nowadays? Or would you just caveat that with several things? You know, the, the, the thing I always talk about, folks, is if you want to make money, medicine is not the place to do it. Um, if, if money is your entire goal, then there's lots of other ways of making money a lot easier. But the, my, my philosophy is always um, do what you would do if you weren't getting paid for it, and then the money will come along. So money's always secondary. Just do what, what, what you get yeah. pleasure from, what's rewarding to right. you. Yeah, and that's, I mean, mm -hmm. from, from the medical side of things, that's actually a very fulfilling way to lead, lead life, is if you're doing something that you can get engrossed in, um, and, you know, it's, it's much easier to find, to find something you like to do and turn that into a way to make money than it is to find a job that makes money and turn it into something you like to do. Those that's two true. do not match up. Um, you, you go the other way. You find something you like to do, and then uh, that eventually can turn into something that makes money. And we've all had jobs like that too. You know, have yeah. you ever seen the movie Office Space, where they're mm -hmm. <laughs> with a conspiring ways to, you know, to get out of there somehow because yeah. yeah, your, your exactly. life is so miserable. Yeah. The life of Dilbert, you know, yeah. cubicle hell. You know, yeah, you're living like in that little cubicle. You don't have days like that, do you? Uh, no. Well, yeah. I, I have different sets of headaches with insurances and stuff like yeah. that. <laughs> but I, I would imagine every patient is kind of a new challenge. They are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have we have new patients in, coming in all the time, and you know the way the way that we do things. A lot of folks enjoy how how we approach medicine, which is glad why I ended up doing it on my own, mm -hmm. um, because uh, like I said, we we're very unique in how we approach folks. So you're you're doing your own thing. You're running your own business. You're running your own practice. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're the master of your own destiny. I would imagine. 
to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, I'm sure there's a lot of other forces. That are <laughs> yes, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Well, Dr. Roman Nation, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and sharing these personal insights with You're us. You're welcome. And we'll be right back. Hi, I'm David Lovett, and this is your Mad Hatter Minute. Your air conditioning system uses a refrigerant gas called Freon to create cold air. The most common reason an AC stops blowing cold is due to a loss of Freon. Refrigerant is a gas in the AC system and very small holes in the hose, seal, or couplers can allow enough Freon to leak out to prevent the creation of cold air. If your AC system is not blowing cold due to a lot lack of Freon, it's important to identify the part that's leaking, replace the part that's leaking, and flush the entire AC system. Over time, the inside of the AC system can deteriorate and become contaminated with various bits of debris. These contaminants can clog up the different components of the AC system, preventing proper circulation of the refrigerant. Even worse, Contamination can restrict the flow of Freon to critical AC parts such as the, the AC compressor. Failure of these parts can lead to a costly repair. The only way to clean your AC system of contaminants is flushing the, the system when repairs are done. Not flushing the system is a substandard repair and will lead to more AC problems down the road. Lastly, if your AC isn't blowing as cold as it used to, Check the serpentine belt. A loose serpentine belt or worn serpentine belt leaves a belt slippage which puts additional strain on the compressor. Replacing your serpentine belt as scheduled will increase the life of your AC compressor. I'm David Lovett and that has been your Mad Hatter Minute. Hey folks, this is Joshua Brown with Mad Hatter on 23rd Street. Is your check engine light on? If it is, text MADHAT28 that's Mad Hat 28 to 24247, and we'll check it for free. Welcome back to the show, and Happy New Year. I am here with Dr. Aaron Shores from Spine and Neuropain Center here in Panama City. And now, as I said center, it's specialists. Specialist, that's, Spine yeah. and Neuropain specialists. Thank <laughs> God you're wearing those scrubs. I can read your pocket. <laughs> I do this every time. It's been going on like this for a long time now. I should be ashamed of myself. But at any rate, and I say Panama City, but you're in Chipley mm -hmm. and soon to be in Mariana. Correct. Yeah, we're opening a new office uh, 1st of January in Mariana. Wow, congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, what brings you to Mariana? Is, I guess there's a need for your specialty in that area. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I enjoy Mariana. I enjoy the mm -hmm. I-10 corridor and, and uh, I <laughs> so, think... So you're the one. Uh, <laughs> I'm the one. <laughs> I know Mariana's fine, the I-10 corridor. Uh, yeah. yeah, well I, I don't know about driving on I-10, but okay. the folks up there are really nice folks. Sure they and, are. And, yeah. uh, we certainly enjoy going up there. So uh, I think there's a need and I think, um, you know, hopefully we can bring uh, bring something to the Jackson County area that, um, you know, that can provide a service to, to the patients in that area. Yeah, I mean, humans are humans wherever they are, and we all share the same experience, and especially when it comes to, you know, pain. You know, people have chronic pain everywhere. Yeah. You know, not just in the little cities. <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot of folks up there, I think, in need, and, you know, the drive to Panama City to to Mariana, for example, is often, yeah. you know, I hear oftentimes that that's a very difficult drive for folks to make, so. If Can you imagine that, having chronic <laughs> back pain and having to drive an hour? Yeah. Or yeah. so? Yeah, yeah, and I think that I hear that on a daily basis, so yeah. I, I hopefully, um, hopefully the folks in Jackson County will, um, you know, we can, like I said, provide a service for them that will help them in, in, a, in their local area and support their community. So you obviously have patients in, in Jackson County already who make the trip here to Panama City just to see you or to Chipley. Correct. To see yeah. So I, I hopefully we can mm -hmm. try to narrow their travel and, and uh, provide a different service to that area and, and hopefully fulfills you know some needs and help some patients. Yeah, and that's and that's what you do all this for, I suppose. Yeah. You know, when they put a new McDonald's up somewhere, they do a market study. You know, right. you is is it that scientific or do you just say, hey, I got a lot of patients up there, I need to be there. Uh, it's more the latter. I I, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that I'm I'm uh, I do market studies to do that. Mm -hmm. I just uh, you know kind of look at the patient population and look at uh, some of the dialogue we have with some of the other physicians in the area and and uh, you know it's somewhat of a leap of faith. So we hope we're successful. Um, mm -hmm. We hope we can we can provide good care to the to the area and to the patients in that community and and uh, if we can, hopefully we'll be there for a while. Mm -hmm. and good. If, 
If we can't, then we won't be. Well, you know. <laughs> It's that easy. It's that easy. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but I guess the thing is just bringing the care to the people, and that's what's important, particularly with people with chronic pain. Correct. And, and we hear oftentimes, even in, the, in our yeah. Chipley area, that you know the smaller towns, it's really tough sometimes to get specialists to come to uh, the smaller rural areas and some of these underserved areas. So a lot of times these patients have to travel not only to Panama City, but to Tallahassee or, or other sure. areas where they have quite a long commute. A lot of times these patients don't have a lot of extra money, so even the fuel cost these days it mm. is, uh, is a bit onerous for them. Um, so again, I think if we can bring our, our services um, you know, to the rural communities and be able to provide some care that helps people locally, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think it's a great idea just bringing it out to the people like that. Now you're uh, also bringing some new therapies online soon, and I know we talked very briefly we during are. the break about this. Yeah, the first of the year we're going to start doing, um, there's a, a new technology out uh, using Using uh, electricity in the ear, actually, we have a little device that we're going to start using. It looks very similar to a very small hearing aid, mm -hmm. but it actually works on some of the same electrical circuits, if you will, that that acupuncture works on. And there's a very small wire we can put inside the ear that you can't even hardly see uh, that a patient will wear for a couple weeks at a time. But we can, depending on where we place that wire. Uh, we can control pain in different parts of the body. So uh, the patient can wear it for a couple weeks at a time. It, again, it's very small, looks like the new state-of-the-art hearing aids, you can hardly see it. And then they take it off for a month or so, and if they need to reapply it down the road, they can get several weeks uh, or uh, months of relief with it without the need for frequent injections or medications. Uh, or long car trips. Or long car trips, yeah. right. And it can be done right in the office, uh, very minimally be, invasive. And, and this will be available in all, all you know, in, in Chipley, Panama City, and Marianne? Correct, in all three of our offices mm -hmm. starting the uh, 1st of January, uh, just in a few weeks. Dr. Aaron Shores, Happy New Year, and thank you so much for everything that you do to keep people out of pain. Thank you, sir. Mer Happy New Year. <laughs> Same to you. And we'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to the show. I'm here with Thomas Winterman, who is the author of The Thrive Life, a great self-improvement book and kind of guide you on how to be a better you. Thomas, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Here it is, the new year. We're staring down the barrel of 2015. That's right. What's our Thrive Thought for the new year? It's to get smart about your goals. Get smart about your goals. Yeah, people, meaning what? Well, people make New Year's resolutions almost every year. You know, if you're like me, sure. And then most of the time, you fall off the wagon. Yeah. You know, long before the year is done. Well, you can make an unrealistic resolution too. That's it. That's like it. I'm going to make a million dollars this year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And well, people yeah. make mistakes. They blame themselves when they fall short of their goals. When in actuality, they had bad goals. Mm. So we're, we're not looking at it the right way. You're it's, sounding like a little bit like a dream crusher right that, now, That's it. Thomas. Like, it's, you know, it's not your fault yeah. that, you know, you couldn't suddenly compete in a triathlon because, you know, no human person is capable of doing that. So slow down and make smart goals, goals that you can achieve, and you'll find yourself maybe getting to a point where you achieve those resolutions. I have heard and read, or maybe I just dreamed it, uh, I've, I've read that you've got to put at least 10,000 hours into any endeavor mm -hmm. before you start to become really successful at it consistently. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And you know, I say all the time, goal setting is a skill and not a talent. That means mm -hmm. you can't just wake up and do it one day a year and be good at it. Right. It takes time, it takes practice, it takes tools and knowledge. It's not something people just wake up and know how to do. You have to learn how to set good goals for yourself. And above all, it takes time. That's right. You have to have respect mm -hmm. for, the, for the harvest. That's right. As Covey would say, yeah. you know, you have to have respect for the harvest. Plant the seeds, you gotta nurture them. It takes a season or two to get that full crop, to get the bounty of your work. That's right. So, uh, so what type of goals should we be looking at? What would you characterize as an attainable, reasonable goal? Well, it depends on what you want. And mm -hmm. that's really the, the determining factor because nobody's going to get anything that they don't really want. Mm -hmm. So make your goals something that you really want, something that you want to get. The more motivated you are, the more likely you are to achieve it. For most people, it's something like weight loss. Right. So let's go ahead and say, you know, the average um, healthy weight loss, they say, is one to two pounds per week. So if you're looking at a month, you're looking at a max of eight pounds, four to eight pounds. I want to lose five pounds in a month. That's reasonable, mm -hmm. that's good, that's attainable, that's something you can do. And in six months to a year, you can reach your goal. That's it, and if then 
got that much weight to lose. You've got to get really specific with it too. Right. I want to lose five pounds. How are you going to lose five pounds? Are you going to diet? Are you going to exercise? What kind of diet are you going to do? What kind of exercise program do you want to do? How many days a week? How long during each day do you want to do it? You've got to get really specific with this stuff when it comes to goal setting. So the goal setting isn't just like one overarching goal that's kind of vague, like I'm going to lose 30 pounds this year. You're going to say, yeah, I'm going to lose 30 pounds, but I'm going to do it in six months at five pounds a month. That's right. Every and, goal should and, have. And I'm going to lose those five pounds by yeah. eating less and going to the gym three times a week. That's you really it. got to plan it out. There should be micro goals within each overarching goal that will help you get to your ultimate end. I just did public math, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so how do we get your book? To improve our lives for 2015. You can get it on amazon.com. You search for The Thrive Life or you can search for my name, Thomas Winterman. Okay, amazon.com, The Thrive Life. Read it, get it. Happy New Year, we'll see you next time.